The central event in apoptotic intrinsic pathway is mitochondrial automembrane permeabilization or rupture of the automitochondrial membrane. Because with disruption of this extreme increase in permeability of the mitochondrial outer membrane, the content in mitochondrial intramembrane space will release into the cytosol. Primarily, it's cytochrome C, apoptosis inducing factors, and inhibitors of apoptosis proteins antagonists. The major player here is cytochrome C. Once cytochrome C is released into the cytosol, it initiates a caspase cascade. Cytochrome C binds to apoptotic protease activating factor 1. This complex together with ATP molecule binds to procaspase 9. This results in formation of a massive protein complex called apeptosome. In apeptosome, inactive procaspase 9 is converted to its active form, caspase 9. Caspase 9 called initiator caspase because it activates downstream caspases, it's caspase 3, 6 and 7. They called executioner caspases because they have proteolytic activity. They cleave intracellular proteins and by this they cause severe structural damage to them. They affect four major categories of intracellular proteins. It's mediators and regulators of apoptosis, structural cellular proteins, cellular DNA repair proteins and cell cycle related proteins. And we see that all these proteins are of vital importance for the cell and structural damage to them inevitably leads to a cellular death. And when caspase is destroyed inner content of the cell, at this point cellular death become inevitable and cell disassemble itself into multiple small particles that are called apoptotic bodies. And also cell gives signal to macrophages and to neighboring cells with phagocytic activity to eliminate them. To explain this, at final stage of apoptosis, when cellular content is packed into apoptotic bodies, cell gives sort of common DITME signal to macrophages. And this signal is provided by the substances that are normally present inside the cell. One of those substances is phosphatidylserin, which is a normal condition located on the cytoplasmic side of the cell membrane. Logically, the only possibility for phosphatidylserin to appear outside the cell is disrupted cell membrane. And obviously, once cell membrane is disrupted, cell is finished. So the signal in form of phosphatidylserin molecule basically tells macrophages that the cell is dying and its content must be eliminated. In response to this, macrophages approach to the site where apoptosis occurred and phagocyte apoptotic bodies. So cytochrome C initiates caspase cascade that results in cell death by apoptosis. Caspase proteolytic activity is regulated by specific protein molecules called inhibitors of apoptosis proteins. The most well-known member is X-link inhibitor of apoptosis protein. These molecules inhibit caspase activity. The mechanism is that inhibitors of apoptosis proteins bind to activated caspases, and by this binding they markedly decrease their activity. So in case if due to some reason caspases become activated, these molecules function as final emergency brakes to stop apoptosis. But interesting that the second substance that is released from mitochondria are the molecules called inhibitors of apoptosis protein antagonists. It's Mac Diablo and Tommy proteins. They inhibit activity of inhibitors of apoptosis proteins. To explain their mechanism of action, let's take the Mac Diablo molecule. Once Mac Diablo P in cytosol, it binds to inhibitors of apoptosis proteins and force them to release binded activated caspases. And once activated caspases is released, they rapidly begin to destroy intracellular proteins that subsequently will result in cell death. So basically, inhibitors of apoptosis proteins antagonists function as inhibitors of inhibitors of apoptosis. The third substance that is released into the cytosol is apoptosis-inducing factor. Once apoptosis-inducing factor released into the cytosol, it moves to the nucleus and gives signal to the nucleus that the cell is dying, and in response to this, nuclei-induced condensation of chromatin and fragmentation of DNA molecule. So basically, apoptosis-inducing factor prepares cell to death. So we have discussed the final stage of apoptotic intrinsic pathway, and the reason why we have started this way is that mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization or rupture of the mitochondrial outer membrane with all these subsequent events that lead to a cell at death it's a common pathway, no matter which factor triggered apoptosis. The analogy is coagulation cascade, where activation of factor 10 with all subsequent events is the same for both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. So all roads lead to alterations in mitochondria outer membrane state. 
But which factors control mitochondrial automembrane permeabilization? And guess what? These factors called proapoptotic and antiapoptotic proteins. The curious thing is that despite their opposite function, they have very much in common. They all members of so-called BCL2 family. They all have BCL2 homology domains, so-called BH domains. But the main difference between them is the quantity of BH domains in their structure. All anti-apoptotic proteins have 4 BH domains. All proapoptotic proteins have less than 4 BH domains. Moreover, the quantity of BH domains in proapoptotic proteins is different. According to that principle, proapoptotic proteins are divided into multi-BH domain proapoptotic proteins that have 3 BH domains, its buck and box proteins, and also bulk protein, but the function of that protein for now is less well understood. The second group is a much larger group of proapoptotic proteins that have only one BH domain. This group called BH3-only proteins is beam beat puma proteins and also bad nox and big proteins. The major difference between multi-domain and BH3-only proteins is that multi-domain proteins as buck and bugs are the central effectors of apoptosis. Once they are activated, they undergo conformational changes, oligomerize, and form poro in automitochondrial membrane. So they directly cause mitochondrial automembrane permeabilization. Basically, we can say that once they are activated, they kill mitochondria directly, and thereby they directly induce apoptosis. In contrast to them, BH3-only proteins cannot kill mitochondria directly. The way to remember this is that they have only one BH3 domain, so they are small and they do not have this power to kill mitochondria directly. But they can help these big guys, as bugs and bug multi-domain apoptotic proteins, to do it. BH3-only proteins can either bind to multi-domain proteins, and by this binding they activate them, so they can directly stimulate them to kill, or they can help them indirectly by inactivation of antiapoptotic proteins. And obviously, once they neutralize inhibitors of box and bug proteins, the activity of multi-domain apoptotic proteins tremendously increase. So it's their indirect stimulation. And according to that principle, BH3-only proteins are divided on activators that directly activate bug and box proteins, its beam, beat and puma proteins, and sensitizers that help box and bug proteins indirectly, its bad nox and big proteins. These proapoptotic proteins are very delicately balanced by antiapoptotic proteins that help mitochondria and thereby cell to survive. The major antiapoptotic proteins that we have to know are BCL2 and BCL extra large proteins and also MCL1 protein. The mechanism of all these antiapoptotic proteins is that they simply bind to proapoptotic proteins and sequester them. By this binding, they neutralize the activity and thereby they prevent apoptosis. The specific feature is that each antiapoptotic protein has different binding affinity to proapoptotic proteins and different interactions with them. For example, MCL1 protein, which is nowadays considered the major player among any other antiapoptotic proteins, has strong affinity for bug, beam, nox, and puma proteins, but weak affinity for bad proapoptotic protein. But this high affinity of MCL1 for noxoprotein is actually a weak spot, because noxoprotein, as we see, belongs to sensitizer group of BH3-only proteins that inactivate antiapoptotic proteins. To illustrate this, it's proapoptotic protein that in free state can initiate mitochondrial automembrane permeabilization. To prevent this, MCL1 binds to proapoptotic protein, and by this binding, it neutralizes activity of proapoptotic protein. And when noxoprotein become activated, it binds to MCL1, and this binding forces MCL1 to release proapoptotic protein. And once proapoptotic protein is released, it initiates mitochondrial outermembrane permeabilization, and thereby apoptosis. So it's an example of how anti- and proapoptotic proteins function. But what factors can affect the state of mitochondrial outermembrane? One of those factors is called mitochondrial permeability transition. Mitochondrial permeability transition is a condition when mitochondrial inner membrane that is in normal state is totally impermeable becomes permeable, and this eventually results in rupture of mitochondrial outer membrane. You can find separate video about MPT, so here will be just a general concept. There are two major intracellular states that induce mitochondrial permeability transition. It's calcium overload and oxidative stress. 
They both cause increase in permeability of the inner mitochondrial membrane. This results in two major pathological states. First of all, it causes dissipation of hydrogen proton gradient across inner mitochondrial membrane. This results in uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, and in this state, mitochondria cannot efficiently produce energy, so this leads to bioenergetic failure of the cell. Also, because mitochondrial matrix has higher proteins concentrations than cell or cytosol, fluid is going by encoded gradient from cytosol to mitochondrial matrix. Initially, it results in mitochondrial swelling, and at some critical point of fluid accumulation inside mitochondrial matrix, the mechanical stress on mitochondrial membranes becomes so high that it causes rupture initially of mitochondrial outer membrane and then of mitochondrial inner membrane. And as we already know, disruption of mitochondrial outer membrane leads to release of cytochrome C into the cytosol, where it activates caspase cascade and thereby induce apoptosis. So calcium overload and oxidative stress can induce mitochondrial permeability transition that subsequently results in rupture of mitochondrial outer membrane. And with disruption of mitochondrial outer membrane, cytochrome C released into the cytosol, where it triggers apoptosis, its intrinsic apoptotic pathway itself. But another possibility how apoptosis can be activated by intrinsic signal is DNA damage. And in this case, the major player is protein called P53. To explain this, its cell or cytosol and its mitochondria and on outer mitochondrial membranes there are pro- and anti-apoptotic proteins that are very delicately balanced, and its cell or nucleus with DNA molecule inside. We have to know that P53 molecules are located in cytosol, but P53 has the ability to enter into the nucleus between G1 and S phase, and in the nucleus it monitors the state of DNA molecule. So this protein is very sensitive to any DNA damage. And when DNA damage occurs, P53 becomes activated. With activation, this protein moves to nucleus where it stops cell cycle between G phase and S phase and analyzes the state of DNA molecule. If damage is reversible, it holds the cells at that checkpoint until DNA repair proteins will fix the damage. But if DNA damage is irreversible, it initiates apoptosis. In this case, P53 increased transcription of pro-apoptotic proteins and decreased transcription of anti-apoptotic proteins. So basically the production of pro-apoptotic proteins increased, and then this increased amount of pro-apoptotic proteins migrate to mitochondria and shift this pro-anti-apoptotic balance towards apoptosis. Also some portion of activated P53 proteins migrate from cytosol to mitochondria where they bind to anti-apoptotic proteins, and by this binding, P53 markedly decreases their anti-apoptotic activity. And this aggravates this disbalance and thereby triggers apoptosis. So in case of DNA damage, P53 protein becomes activated, and by increase in transcription of pro-apoptotic proteins and decrease in transcription of anti-apoptotic proteins, it induces mitochondrial optomembrane permeabilization that leads to apoptosis. Because in this pathway P53 plays the key role, this pathway also called P53 activated apoptosis. And we see that P53 protein basically decides the fate of the cell by regulation of pro and anti-apoptotic proteins transcription. So basically P53 regulates apoptosis. And because of that P53 protein together with NF-kappa beta and ubiquitin proteasome system belongs to so-called regulators of apoptosis. Basically, because they can affect the production or the state of other participants in this apoptosis event, they function as a supreme court that decides the fate of the cell. And if we are talking about the initial factors that can cause apoptosis, it's actually a variety of pathological conditions that lead to a calcium overload, oxidative stress, and DNA damage. For example, this can be ischemic reperfusion injuries that primarily cause calcium overload and induce oxidative stress, it can be chemotherapeutic agents or ultraviolet radiation that cause DNA damage and induce oxidative stress. So there are numerous conditions that can activate intrinsic apoptotic pathway. And just to summarize, let's briefly discuss intrinsic apoptotic pathway from the beginning. Let's take chemotherapeutic agent, for example doxorubicin. Doxorubicin primarily causes DNA damage. DNA damage is sensed by P53. And if damage is irreversible, P53 stimulates transcription of pro-apoptotic proteins and inhibits transcription of anti-apoptotic proteins. 
This shifts balance between pro and anti-apoptotic proteins towards apoptosis, and this induces mitochondrial outermembrane permeabilization. Dramatic increase in permeability of the mitochondrial outer membrane leads to release of three substances that induce next step in apoptosis, which is caspase activation. The major player here is cytochrome C that directly activates caspase cascade. Activity of caspase is controlled by apoptotic proteins antagonists that inhibit caspase activity, thereby preventing apoptosis. But the second substance that is released from mitochondria are called inhibitors of apoptotic proteins antagonists. They inhibit activity of apoptotic proteins antagonists and thereby they stimulate activity of caspases. Proteolytic activity of caspases results in total destruction of the cell with formation of apoptotic bodies that then are phagocyted by macrophages. So basically apoptosis is a clean cell or death. Now we see that actually intrinsic apoptotic pathway is a very complex process with a lot of details. Hope that this material helped you a little bit to understand the general principle of this process.